Welcome back to the Missing Mora Murray podcast. How are you today, Lance? I'm doing very well. How are you, Tim? I'm doing well. We have a pretty interesting episode. We have private investigator and bounty hunter Greg Overacker on the show to talk a little bit about his knowledge into the Mora Murray case, a little bit about Brianna Maitland case, and some personal stories from his past. Greg is somebody who we introduced on Crawl Space. He is a detective in Brianna Maitland's disappearance. And like you said, in this episode, it's there's a little bit about Mora because he's recently started looking into that. We talk a little bit about Brianna. Um, but we really, the I remember when we started this, uh, we were just kind of, he just started telling his stories. And the guy tells some some good stories, all of them very relevant to both cases. Sort of a history, you know, how he got to where he is now. And uh, and he just he just started going and we started recording. So we wanted to have him on because he's interesting and because his past makes him a hell of an investigator. And uh, we wanted to get his take since he had been experiencing more of Morris' case than he had previously. Right. The more we started emailing with him and, and he, he texts with us and it just became apparent that this this should be information that is provided to the audience, not so much as a way to say, hey, we got new new stuff of being uncovered, but it's a direction in which the Morris case is going, uh, as well as Brianna's case. And it'll give you a good sense of what is, what's to come. Okay, so we hope you enjoyed the interview. Thank you very much for listening. Brianna was brought up in the way Mora was brought up. Brianna's situation is really sad. Uh, I'm not saying Mora's isn't, but I mean, you guys got to know Bruce a little bit and where she lived and how she was brought up. It was, it, it would seem like it would be the ultimate wholesome place to grow up. It, it just does. And he, you know, we sit and talk to him about the way they lived and, you know, good salt of the earth people that were there and stuff like that. And there's always, and that was what really altered the way I thought, I think as an adult when I was, became a bounty hunter, was that I got to see the real visceral underbelly of society. It was just horrible. I actually can remember having a conversation with friends at my buddy's house. It was all my buddies and their wives and stuff and some friends and Somebody was talking about being on vacation. They said, yeah, you ever been to Washington, D.C.? I said, yeah, I've been to Washington, D.C. Oh, we had a great time. We went to this monument and that monument. And where'd you go? I said, well, in some rat-infested shithole. And some dude ran back in his room and was screaming something about a machete. But don't worry about it. The cops are always real close, you know, <laughs> in those areas. And everybody's right. just kind of staring at me. because I had, I had so fucking had it with that lifestyle. And, um going to all these beautiful places and then going to the really bad part of town, going to people, people love to go to uh, Daytona beach and Fort Lauderdale and all those places. Those places, places are shitholes when you really look at them deep enough. I mean, you guys, obviously you're from Boston or nearby Boston. I lived in Boston for three years. Boston's a beautiful city with a lot of beautiful people. Do you remember when the combat zone was? Up and running? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Down in Chinatown. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. When I moved out there, I got a rude awakening. I came from this little sleepy village and went down to combat zone a few times. And my brother's a cop out there. And matter of fact, I told him I'd go on a ride along with him when I come back out. But, um, you know, I, I went around and this, that was a real culture shock for me and stuff like that. But anyway, you know, you look at uh, where Brianna lived, there was, there's obviously and still is a really bad element up there. And it's amazing that that could exist. But there's, I guess it's going to be everywhere you do expect it in cities right and you expect just from the the perception that we have of this country you know the cities have their inner cities and the the uh the the rural areas have you know that's what it is it's uh white picket fences and people with two and a half kids and everything's fine but everything's not fine nowhere is everything fine right you know i remember this is going way back 
I had a guy, I used to get calls from like down south, and they would say, will you pick this guy up and bring him down south for me? That's how that business kind of works. You you advertise nationwide. They don't want to drive from Florida all the way up to New York to go looking for somebody. So they call a bounty hunter in New York, and they send you after him, and then you bring him down, and you get paid to come back home. And uh, I had a guy that wanted a guy out of Detroit, and he said, I, I know he's there. I know he's this there and the other thing, and I don't remember the details, but I ended up calling the police station in this area of Detroit, and the cops thought I was, he was shocked. He's like, who are you bringing with you? I said, all right, I'll make him alone. He goes, you're not coming here alone. We don't work in that part of town unless we absolutely have to. He goes, I'm telling you right now, it's a war zone. And I'm like, what? So I end up in Detroit. Amazingly, he wasn't lying to me. It was horrible. I took some people with me, though. It was absolutely horrible to know that in in this country, human beings live that way. I don't know if you've ever gone on YouTube or anything. There's actually videos on there of people just driving around filming from their car, filming neighborhoods. There was an article in Rolling Stone about the fact that so many people moved out of Detroit and they just left their animals behind, that they Mm -hmm. were roaming packs of pit bulls, packs of them. And they talked about this, I don't remember how many square mile area, block-wise it was, and there was like some astronomical amount of dogs, like 1,500 to 2,000 pit bulls running around in packs. And it wasn't that way when I was there. I didn't see a bunch of pit bulls and stuff. But we actually went to a street. There was no street lights. They're all blasted out, gone. Went to a house that was locked up like Fort Knox. You couldn't see in any of the windows. Doors had bars on them, everything. And we went up and started pounding on the door. It was crazy. <laughs> Fucking, there's people in between houses shouting at you and stuff. So you were the they pack of the pit police. bulls. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what ended up happening was you're not recording, right? Uh, we we started recording. We don't have to use actually. It, yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. We started it's recording. it's a, it's, a, it's a really fascinating story. It's unbelievable. You're gonna have to edit this up pretty good because I don't want a lot of this out there. But what ended up happening was when you're in those neighborhoods. There's always people watching. Greg does they not want the story out there, so we are going to skip to a part where we're talking more about his bounty hunting past. It's a really strange thing to drive hundreds and hundreds of miles, completely away from anything you know, in a different state, possibly yep. different laws. Sometimes laws you got to research and everything. Literally grab someone off the street or even out of their own home, put them in a car, shackle them up, put them in a car, and then drive them a thousand miles or more and turn them into a jail. That's a comfortable thing to do, I take it. Really bizarre. (laughs) Really bizarre. I can remember I drove all the way to Florida with a woman in my car one time, and we were still in New Jersey at one point and uh, took her into a a throughway stop, but it wasn't a throughway. But it was a huge uh, rest area. We got inside the building, and it was just packed, and uh, she needed to go to the bathroom, so we were going to find a female security guard to take her to the bathroom. We got in there, and uh, she collapsed in front of everybody on purpose. Everybody oh. kind of surrounded us in a crowd, you know. There was a crowd around us and stuff. And uh, we actually heard people going, that poor woman, the poor woman. This woman was calling in bomb threats to a bar down in Florida. So... But the trooper came over, said, we're going to the back room, took us in the back room. You never know. The troopers were really professional. They they know the deal with this business and everything. And uh, he looked right at her and he said, what's the matter? You don't want to go to jail? He said, you're going to Florida. <laughs> he let me let us go. But he knew. He looked at our paperwork and everything, and I showed it to yeah. him. And he goes, okay, you're legal. But uh, she couldn't believe it that he was just going to let it, you know, turn her back over to these two hoodlum-looking guys and take her to Florida. Which, you know, so now you got to drive through all these states, through, you know, whatever, little towns, big cities. You can stop any number of times. You don't know what cop you're going to run into when you go, what the hell's going on here? you got a woman shackled up in your car, you know? I'd be nervous that uh, by the time I got to, like, South Carolina or Georgia, the woman would have convinced me that everything that happened in her life it was, you know... <laughs> was wrong and 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 all of a sudden like she's convinced me to drive her to like san diego and you just let her out <laughs> and just let her out <laughs> I, I feel like my my compassion would get the better of me you'd stop in vegas and yeah. get married first 
this woman would have convinced you of nothing good. <laughs> <laughs> so what is that job she like, had, though? I'm pretty weak-minded. <laughs> I literally caught her twice. I caught her once going out of a hotel. You know those little tiny windows in, in cheap hotels over top of the toilet? She was going out there, and I had her by the ankles. She was up and gone. But wow. I could see her ass and her leg back up by the ankles. And the cop came running in behind me, and he goes, is that her? <laughs> I'm sure that's her. <laughs> I'm just assuming the woman going out the window is the girl I'm after. <laughs> I, had to, I had to pick her up twice, and the second time I went to get her, I went to the cops, and I said, she's going to run like hell. This and that, and I said, but I think the girl, her daughter, she's out with her, I think she's listed as a runaway. So the cop went up to the door, and the little girl answered the door. Well, she wasn't little, but he said, I need to talk to your mother. And uh, she didn't want to come outside. He said, you just come out here. Your daughter's listed as a runaway. She came out on the porch, and she goes, no, she's not listed as a runaway. He goes, well, I want, to, I want, to, I want you to meet somebody. And I jumped out from behind a tree. Well, I just stepped out from behind a tree, and she goes, oh, shit. Turned around and ran back in the house. So I just ran in the house and got her, pulled her out of there. But, yeah, she she somehow she went down to Florida, got rebailed out, came back up, started doing the same shit all over again. But yeah, she wouldn't have convinced you of anything other than you want to take her back to jail. How long did you do that, or, or have you done that? I still do occasionally. I uh, eh, Not a lot anymore, usually just for the locals that I work for, but... I did two years full time. I probably did it for twelve or fifteen altogether. How does that make you a better investigator? Well, if you don't if you don't find them, you don't get paid. I mean, if you don't come home with that body, you don't get paid. So you have to you you better you either figure it out or you go out of business. You got to think about that. If somebody says, "Hey, I want you to find so and so," a lot of times they know where they are. They'll call you up and say, "Hey, you staying at uncle's or he's doing this or doing that." But if, if not, you've got to look for a person among millions. I mean, and, and a lot of times these guys, it doesn't matter what their charges are, even if it's petty or if it's big, they don't hide any better usually. It's a really weird thing. But a lot of times what we do is run the girlfriend's credit. If you run the girlfriend's credit and she's applied for credit, she uses an address, that's where the guy is. The guy's always around the girl. There's basic rules. The basic rule is that people are creatures of habit. If you want to disappear, yeah. you can do it. But you can't talk to family anymore. You can't talk to friends. You can't, if you're a gambler, you can't go in casinos anymore. You know, you can't, you got to break all your ties, take up completely different things, move to a completely different area. You know, if you're used to living in Boston, you're not going to move to a farm somewhere. People always stick with what they know. Here in New York, I would get calls from guys down, you know, New Jersey or farther south, and people would try to run up into Canada. So the people that would sign on their bond, you know, the co-signer, they would put up a house or something, and now this person that they care about and did this for, they're going to lose their house over them, so they get pissed. They would turn them in. You know, they would call us and say, hey, one of them was, um, a guy called me up, he said, look, they're going to be at this hotel at this time, in this room, she's meeting him there so he can kiss his baby before he takes off and goes into Canada, and then we're never going to see him again. And there's, right. you can't bounty. It's illegal. So, sure enough, go up, knock in the door. Girl opened the door for me, knew I was coming. He's shocked. And then, yeah, you basically pull your gun and just, you know, that's it. It's over. You know, that's a, that's a, a common thing here where people would try to run into Canada. And, you know, prior to, and I, I don't know now, I haven't been into Canada since I went up into Windsor there. That was, that was quite a few years ago. But it used to be, you could just walk in. I mean, up by St. Albans there where you guys were, you can just walk. There's no fence or anything. You can just walk in. Yeah. But, you know, on the larger areas where there's a lot of drug drugs now coming over, you know, they have all kinds of sensors and cameras and stuff like that. But do you think that's on the whole border? No way. want to tell you a little bit about our new sponsor harry's razors now when we started acquiring sponsorships i remember telling tim that i think i had just shaved and i said i i hope that we get harry's harry's razor i'm pleased to say that we have a new sponsor in harry's razor a company i've been a fan of and i believe you just started with them tim right yeah i mean the shave is ridiculous 
and my girlfriend uses it and says it's the closest shave on her legs that she can get. For decades, one big razor company has relentlessly increased prices and reaped immense profits at the expense of its customers. So Jeff and Andy, two ordinary guys who are fed up with getting ripped off, started Harry's to fix shaving. I love stories like this, don't you? It's, it's incredible. And this even applies to our female listenership. You have these products that are, that are designed for females and they pay an exorbitant amount of money. Now, Harry's knew that there was one way to ensure quality, so they bought their own blade factory. By taking less profit and selling directly to you over the internet, Harry's offers their blades at half the price. It's just $2 a blade compared to $4 or more you'll pay at the drugstore. And might I say, I've never paid $4 for a blade aside from Harry's. Yeah, it's usually more expensive. It's like 20. It's like 20 to 30 bucks because you buy like a pack of four. It's like 17.99. Harry's is so confident you'll love their blades. They're giving you their trial set for free. Just cover the $3 shipping. Hey Tim, what does the trial set include? It's a weighted ergonomic razor handle, five precision engineered blades with lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel and a travel blade cover. That's a $13 value for you to try. Stop messing around and get started shaving with Harry's today by claiming your free trial offer. $13 value for free. Just cover shipping. To get your free trial set, including a razor handle, five blade cartridge, and shave gel, go to harrys.com slash mora right now. That's harrys.com slash mora. You mentioned uh, that people are creatures of habit, and that is one of the ways that you're able to locate individuals. What is it about? Have you noticed anything or or have you looked into any of of Moore's habits and how you'd find her based on those habits? You know, like I told you, I I, I don't I only know the basics of Moore's case. I mean, I I, the only reason I, I, I know I really know that well is that because when I start reading stuff about you know, that John Smith's written or about or talked about and stuff that, like, Renner's, I used to read his blog occasionally. Some of the things they got into, I was like, well, I didn't know about this. So I didn't know if they were, in, in Renner's blog, I didn't know if they were 100% true or what, but they used to really tear things apart and decipher them and things like that. But I don't know a whole lot about her, but, yeah, I mean, if I was the one that was looking for her, I would definitely want to know what her habits were. I would definitely, I mean, I'm sure that Fred's, the people that work directly for Fred, the PIs, I'm sure he gave them a rundown mm-hmm. in the information of her prior to. I think he just didn't want to talk about that stuff to the general public because that's personal business. Um, You know, Bruce really understands that. Bruce Maitland knows that there's a certain amount of guilt, whether it's due to you or not, you feel guilty and you don't like everybody in the world knowing if you you feel like people are peeking in your windows every day of every minute of every day, you know, some things have to be sacred. And I'm sure he sat down with them and said, look, this is what was going on. Or she was having problems with this or that, whatever. But yeah, you know, I, I know that that was a big thing. And like I said, I don't know runner from boo. I talked to him, I think once on the phone, but, um, yeah, I know he had thought that she had gone up to Canada. Um, I can't imagine that. For starters, if you go up to Canada, at some point you're going to have to have some kind of identification, you know, for something, anything. I mean, what if she ever has to go to an emergency room? What if she ever has to make a doctor's visit? I mean, they have health care up there that's government health care. It, it just it would seem too difficult. She'd have to have a driver's license. She'd have something. Plus, I can't imagine her breaking all ties from her family. Mm-hmm. That's a really difficult thing to do. It, people say, oh, but it's happened, and they cite, they cite a case where it's happened. But usually when you look into those cases, it's people with mental health problems or people that are in a real lot of trouble or who had a really horrific uh, life full of abuse, mm-hmm. things like that. It can be done 90% of the time at someone with a mental illness. I can't imagine that she would she would get herself up there, get herself into Canada, which she could have done successfully, gotten into Canada. But then to just exist up there, 
But yeah, it would be nice to know her habits and things like that. I think for the most part, we know a lot of them. Yep. Yeah, we know that she ran track. We know that she stayed pretty active. We know that she um, enjoyed to drink at times. So when we went up to Canada, some of the places that we focused on were um, gyms and bars. Mm-hmm. Well, well we, 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 we focused, sorry to interrupt, we focused on the bars because Renner's thought was it would be easier for somebody like Mora to get a job at a bar because for some reason he thought you could walk into a bar and be a young, attractive female and say, hey, Mr. Bar Owner, I, I need a job, and they would never question it. What I've seen, though, is that she didn't party that crazy. She she was at she was at West Point for God's sake. Like you don't take those principles and go to another school and and just lose it in less than a year and and start partying. Every college person partied. Even the even the even the quote unquote like party she had that night that she crashed her dad's car. It started off at one point in this folklore of Maura Murray that there was this party and and. and at a dorm and you know it's crazy that people don't remember who was there and you know it turns out it's probably just some like four or five people hanging out that they hung out come to find out it was completely different and one of the girls was asleep or something right yeah yeah so actually let me let me ask you this as as a as a professional investigator um and you're you're accredited correct yeah well, I'm licensed. Yeah. okay so as a licensed investigator you're approached by the Murray family. This is a hypothetical. You're approached by the Murray family right now, 13 years later, and they say, we want you to put fresh eyes on this case. Where would you start? Well, first thing I would say to them is knowing that they've had the guys that they've had involved on their side, I'd say you're in pretty good hands. Um, From what I understand, they've had some pretty good PIs working on their behalf, and I would say you're in good hands. Probably guys that are over my head. Where would I start from? Well, first of all, well, going back to what you said about that party, it, how, how you, you end up finding out a lot of stuff like that. Why was she at this party? And this one girl claims that she doesn't remember who all was there and this and that. And then when it comes to be, you realize that, well, there was only four people there and one of them was asleep. So probably not a huge bang and party and probably not everybody getting completely shit faced. And if you meet, I don't, I, I party. I, I've met, you know, I'm 50 years old. I've met people that will have five beers and that's their limit, man. And I've, I've met people that can drink all night long. So, you know, I, I what, what was she carrying in the car when they found her, the booze in her car? They knew what she purchased, correct? I mean, allegedly, Okay, so all we know that she was carrying in her car at the time that her car was found was the box of uh, Franzia wine. But yeah, I didn't know much about that, but I just always thought that was interesting. It's funny how you see how things that seem one way end up seeming a different when you really look into it closely. Absolutely. But anyway, your question was, where would I start looking for more? Is that what was your question? Yeah, correct. When you look at everything that happened at the crash site, I guess that would be a good start. And then, of course, I'd want to talk to Fred at length. And again, you know, when we, we talked about Fred really didn't want to talk to Renner, well, look at the circumstances, you can't really blame him. Um, yeah. Bruce te- uh, texted texted me a couple weeks ago um, saying that he was almost done with Renner's book. And uh, he said that he that, that you gave him the book and that uh, yeah. and that he he was pretty skeptical with with our work with Renner and was very concerned um I will say so what what did you what did you say to Bruce about the book I I actually told him I enjoyed the book um and I'll read anything I don't care if it's written by somebody that doesn't know what the hell they're doing if it's out there and it's going to be considered in the main pool of knowledge I want to read it and I want to decipher for myself whether I believe it's bullshit or not um, I just like the way he wrote. I'm an avid reader. Mm-hmm. I, I, got, I gobble up books. So I like the way he he wrote. So if I enjoy the way someone writes, it makes the book that much easier to read. Do I believe, do I think his information is going to be helpful at any point? That I don't know. I guess that's to be seen. Do I think, I, I think that... Uh, 
Well, you know, I got to say this, and the runner's not going to like it, but, if, you know, I, I think it's despicable to go after Fred. I think that's absolutely despicable. And I, I don't think there's any truth to it. I think Fred's just a father who's really hurt. And, you know, you look at some of the comments. Didn't he say that a, a, a relative said, well, he was with Fred, and they were out, and they were looking up at the mountain, and Fred said, well, she's up there somewhere naked, drunk or something. Yeah. You got to look at that in the context. Of Fred's probably damn near lost his mind when this is going on. He thinks at the, the beginning, actually, Bruce and I talked about this. But he probably thinks she ran off somewhere with a friend, and four days later, she's going to come back and go, Look, look, what do you mean you're all looking for me? You know, mm-hmm. he doesn't know at that point. Not, I don't know exactly when this took place, but, you know, you could take that comment a million different ways. He, he may not have been anything bad by it. It seems ominous if you look at it one way. Um, you know, and I don't think she ran off on her own. I think that's something that maybe he believed in wholeheartedly. But I did enjoy the book, and I wanted to read it. Um, I wouldn't have ba- I wouldn't have paid for it. I stole it. So, <laughs> you know, I said it to Bruce, and I said, you know, if you don't want to read it, don't read it. If you want to read it, read it. And uh, he gave it back to me when he came up for dinner. But, you know, I, I think that really hits a nerve with him when you start accusing Fred of anything because you know Bruce has just been pulled through the meat grinder on this whole thing he's just at his you, yeah I, I can't even you know a lot of times when somebody goes through something horrible you can sit down and put yourself in their situation and say that would be horrible you can't even put yourself into this situation it's just so bad it was so impressive I think we've said this before it was so impressive to us uh, how he can uh, compartmentalize what what what's happened in the past and where his life is right now just uh, is so impressive and and yeah you you can't put your yourself in in the position of these guys i remember bruce i think it was like the second communication we ever had with bruce said when he talked to fred they they said to each other we're members of a club that no one ever wants to be a part of yeah it's it's incredible it's incredible that these and everybody handles things differently yeah okay so you're you're members of a club that everybody that no one wants to be a part of but that doesn't mean that it's literally you know there are no rules to this club I wanted to take a second to tell our audience about this new subscription service box called Hunt a Killer. Now, they've heard about it because people are obsessed, and we've been talking about it on the show. Hunt a Killer sends a package to your home each month full of creepy correspondence from their killer curator. He's a little like Hannibal Lecter, and he's got a mystery for you to solve. Obsessed is the accurate term here. I know I've become a little bit obsessed with it, and I'm sure you've become a little bit obsessed with it. Uh, I'm considering taking time off from my day job just for my monthly uh, clues, because each month you'll receive new clues, letters, articles, objects, tools, all adding to the ongoing murder mystery. And it's up to you to solve it, along with the thousands of other members all working together in this online community. It's a perfect thing for any armchair detective looking to put their sleuthing skills to the test. Hunt a Killer is growing so fast that they have to limit new members to 500 a week. So once you apply and you are approved for membership, you will receive a private link to subscribe. Then a monthly package arrives on your door. Waiting is the hardest part. I want to make the Tom Petty reference, but I won't. Now, Hunt a Killer has been featured in BuzzFeed, Fast Company, and Bustle. Hunt a Killer is forming a cult-like community of web sleuths and amateur detectives. If you love poring over creepy codes, ciphers, and clues, Hunt a Killer is simply perfect. And if it's not for you, I have a feeling if you're listening to this show, you know at least one person that would love to receive it as a gift. No doubt about it. So we cannot recommend this membership enough. To help support this show, Hunt a Killer has offered a 10% discount for our listeners, which is tracked to this message. Use code MISSING and get 10% off. That's the code MISSING when you sign up at Hunt a Killer.
I asked Bruce a couple of times over the years. I've said to him, how do you do it, man? How do you hold it together? And he, basically he says, well, once he said God, once he said, if I don't, where am I left? Exactly. You know, it's, to do it. I got to yep. keep trying. So, wow. Yep. You know, but you know, I think when, I think when Bruce and Kelly moved out of Vermont too, you know, they caught a little flack for that. But by that point they were like, we don't give a shit what you think about what the, the, the decisions that we make because we're making them for us. And the, the reason they made their decisions, and there's another situation where you could look at something and see something totally evil and then look at it, you know, considerably and see, see it a different way. You know, I asked him about that, and he said, look, man, every day when you get up, I remember Kelly, Kelly telling me she'd go to work in the morning and she'd stop at McDonald's to get a cup of coffee, and the girl would hand out the coffee out the window and give her this big sad look and say, I'm yeah. sorry. And she goes, I started my day. And she goes, it would go on all day long. Mm. You know, well, they they had to get away from it. That I get a, a sense of normalcy a little bit. Um, you know, the other thing, you know, looking back in, in the book there, Leonard's book was he talked about going to Fred's house and looking through the garbage, and I think he found a, a, a dirty magazine or something. Yep. And some pictures of relatives, some yeah. female relatives. <laughs> Actually, Bruce and I were in the car the other night, and we were going to dinner, and I said, Hey, how'd you feel if I picked through your garbage? And he's like, you're picturing my garbage, man. We're going to have an issue. <laughs> you know, I never even considered going to the Maitland's house and picking through their garbage. I went to their house. I went to, you no, know, it was for sale at the time. There was no one living there. And I told him I was going there. And I walked the property and looked around. I just wanted to know where that property was as opposed to other things because it was in the area. So, and I called him while I was on the property and said, how far am I from the Canadian border? You know, and he said, well, go down to the this store and talk to them. They're friends of mine and, you know, nice people. And we ended up interviewing a guy who said, hey, I was their garbage man. You know, stuff like that. And just, we didn't, we inadvertently bumped into him. But, you know, I got a sense of the way they lived, too. They lived, um, you know, they had about a half a mile long driveway and they had water power and solar power and, the two houses on the property. Whalen lived in one, their son, and they lived in the other. Well, I think Katie told you it was a Katie or Kira that um, they didn't even have a microwave. Mm-hmm. You know, they kind of lived a very wholesome way and worked out. And you know, Bruce loves working off the land. He'd do it today if he could and stuff like that. But I think in in Fred's situation, you know, <laughs> you're driving way out of the way to go to his house to stick to his garbage. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I can. It would be like me driving to where Bruce lives now and going through his garbage. Just, you know, years after the fact. I mean, what are you expecting to find years after the fact in their garbage? Yeah, we, we had heard that that wasn't Fred's, that Fred had really nothing to do with that house at that point anyway, that he may have owned it, but he was not staying in there and hadn't been uh, been living there for years. So however those pictures ended up yeah. in there, there was someone else that they mentioned uh, that it probably was, but it wasn't Fred. If you lost it, the child that way, and you lost your home and ended up in a rehab or a homeless shelter, lost every penny you had in your job and everything, I wouldn't be a bit shocked. I mean, that's, uh, people have to lose their mind. I was with someone uh, years ago who lost a child, and she knew how she lost him. She knew that it was coming. It was a drug issue, and absolutely altered her, changed her life, and it was devast- absolutely devastating, absolutely crushed her. Can you imagine not knowing, the just not knowing part? Yeah. And for just for Fred to be able to get up and go to work every morning and maintain that at all is, is, is amazing. It's amazing what, like, the human being will become when they endure. It seems to me like you, you guys, I know I have, you guys have probably been through some kind of shock, right? And it feels like that it's like an out-of-body experience. It feels like you're having an out-of-body experience as you're doing it. You're almost like you're seeing yourself say these words. And don't you think that's that's exactly how it was for Fred and Bruce? Like talking to the media five days after or a week after? Like no wonder you act, maybe you're, you act a little weird or maybe someone perceives it as weird. It's because you don't know what normal is at that moment. 
Right. It's called shock therapy. That That's what the definition of shock therapy is. You shock somebody to the point where they have the thousand yard stare on. And no matter what happens, they're they're going by the numbers like they're just moving by the motions that they that they feel like, OK, this is what I'm supposed to say. This is what I'm supposed to say because their body and their brain, they're just reacting to what should be natural at the time. Yeah totally get what you're saying right but i could see like someone like crying or something and, and someone saying oh that that looks fake that those tears look fake and maybe that person who's crying i'm not saying this is bruce or fred but maybe that person who is crying is like why, why am i not crying right now and and i have to, i need to cry yeah and i need to cry yep. and so it, it looks super suspicious when you look at it from a certain viewpoint but it's only because you can't imagine being that person and that's in that moment absolutely yep you know, Bruce got really, I think, affected by the fact that you say something and it just comes off different in print. It comes off different uh, in interviews and stuff like that. You just It gets taken the wrong way by people. They don't understand certain aspects. They don't know what he knows, things like that. And I don't think Fred wants to have his words twisted around. You know, Fred did... Fred did some public appearances. He was on a, a television show. I can't remember which one. He did, yeah. He did Montel, Montel Williams. You know, at one point, Bruce and Kelly had done a couple of shows, and he had call, he called me quite a few times and said, do you want to be on this show? Do you want to be on that show? And I said, well, what do you think? Is it beneficial for us? No. Well, then I'm not doing it. He said, he said Nancy Grace wants us to come on. Do you want to go do it for us? Do you want me to? Not really. Well, then fuck Nancy Grace. He goes, she just wants us to get up there and cry and for, you know, whatever two minutes they're going to have us on. Out of, you know, when you look at a television show, it's 30 minutes long or whatever. I mean, what is it, 22 minutes long? And they want you two minutes of that to be the parents crying. How dare you accuse our friend Nancy Grace of trying to good, uh, our ex- good exploit friend. families? On a, serious, on a serious note, I can totally see how people like Bruce and Fred and doing this for the past couple of years, you can totally see how it doesn't matter what your intentions are as somebody from this 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 side of it. Your intentions are, are could be the, the the purest, most like 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 the, the the purest intentions to try to help, and they've been burned and every question, every answer is just like manipulated. And it's better to just not say anything. I can't remember what show it was, but he told me specifically there was one show where he goes, that you could tell they wanted us to be distraught. They wanted us to cry. But you could tell. They were, they were Bruce, trying to force the situation. Bruce told you that? So, yeah. 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 It was a television show that he was on. I saw some news footage, footage of Bruce one time talking in front of a crowd of people. I had never seen it before. And it was really odd for me because, you know, I came in two years after the fact. So when I came in, I had to get up to speed and everything, and it had already been two years. And to see him in those initial days out there in front of a crowd of people who were going to help him, the community, and him talking to them, because Bruce is, you know, you met him, he's a, he, but he's a quiet guy. He, he doesn't want to get up in front of a crowd of people and talk. He doesn't have to. Yeah. Yeah. But he was, he was there and he was doing it, you know. Um, but yeah. There was a lot of things that happened. By the time you know, by the time I came in, when I went and sat down with him, um, you know, Bruce would hardly talk. Uh, Kelly was really chatty, but he would hardly talk. And then, as time went on, I think he realized I wasn't going anywhere, and Kelly and I were constantly in contact. And he, he started coming around when things started happening, producing. When I started producing, he. Yeah, he was just so discouraged with everything. It was so upsetting to him. It just seemed like everything that should have, you know, you think when you get involved with the police that things tick by and things happen and then you come to a resolution because that's what you see on television. That's what you think, you know, ha- happens in real life. Well, it doesn't work that way. And, and and so many things went wrong or were done wrong initially that he was just crazy out of his mind about it. He's just unhappy about it. Yeah, and you said something earlier about there's – even though he might not have, or not him, even though somebody in that position might not have done anything wrong to cause this to happen, there's still this sense of guilt and responsibility because you are the parent or you are related. You have blood with this person. 
it's and and I could totally see and I you know I, I can see myself being in that position and just becoming stoic and just just going into my own thoughts and thinking how am I going to figure this out I don't want any of these other people around me I want to figure it out because I have responsibility for this and I'm holding myself responsible for it could you see yourself shutting off to media too oh absolutely 100 percent saying fuck you I don't care what you think what about the people online? What about the people who write online? I would shut down everything. Would you care about what they write? That's a bizarre thing. Yeah, if you had something that was so important, you'd probably you'd like knock on my door. But in the meantime, I'm going to go do my own thing. But I don't know because, right, like you don't know until you're there, until it's happened. Maybe I would reach out to a bunch of people online and say, hey, let's crowdsource this. But right now hearing 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 you greg talk about it and and talking to bruce and knowing you know knowing where he's at now and hearing him describe where he was at back then and hearing you describe where he was at back then i would you know not knowing the 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 power of the crowdsourcing thing back then yeah I, i would be like no i'm this is this is my thing it's my responsibility Lance, you and I know from talking to different private investigators that they are not all created equal. Greg Overacker could be the blue apron of private investigators. He's fresh, high quality, and he makes a real difference. You know, Tim, it's going to sound strange, but you actually took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say those very words. Blue Apron and Greg Overacker are cut from a different cloth than you and I and other food delivery services. Greg does his work in various different ways, but Blue Apron does it by being the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. And if they've made incredible home cooking accessible to me, Lance, they can make it accessible to everyone. You said it. Let's talk about Blue Apron's featured upcoming meals. Let's talk about the Parmesan-crusted chicken with creamy fettuccine and roasted broccoli. You choose from a variety of new recipes each week, or you let their Blue Apron culinary team surprise you. They're not repeated within a year, so you never get bored. And it's affordable. For less than $10 per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash missing. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash missing. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. In one of your podcasts, it was brought up that, you know, I think it was me that brought it up, actually. She was... But Brianna had been off and on, you know, sleeping in her car, and then she crashed at this friend's house, crashed at that friend's house, stuff like that. And in the comments, somebody wrote, what the fuck is this young girl doing sleeping in cars and stuff like that? I don't remember how it was alluded to, but it was alluded to, you know, her family or her parents or whatever like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the person said someone should have nutted up and taken care of this girl. Yeah, well, the fact of the matter is is that Brianna was going to have it any other way. Bruce was heartbroken over that. He didn't want her to go anywhere. She basically said, look, I'm going. And what did they do? I mean, she was, in another few months or another whatever, she would have been 18 years old. He figured it would be better, you know, to, I don't want to speak for him, rather than cause a huge rift between the two of them. What's he going to do, chain her to the, you know, to the shed or something? You know, rather than cause this huge rift, you know, to let her, he thinking that maybe she'd go out and come back. And, you know, most kids do. But it's just, that's an example of how somebody saying something in the comments is really shitty and it, it's just not a proper comment to make. You know, there is some adage. If you're going to say something like that, at least say it constructively because mm-hmm. you're just not getting your point across. You just look like a fool when you say something shitty like that because you really don't know the circumstances. Right. It was kind of like... Uh, you know, when that affidavit came out and I told you uh, a certain group of people made comments about it, how they don't believe in it and it's absurd and this and that. And I think I told you guys, I said, 
first of all, they don't know where this affidavit came from. They don't know what, under what circumstances it was gained. They've never read it. You know, the, the public has never heard the entire affidavit, just little tiny excerpts. So how can you pass judgment on that? You can't. Well, it's the same thing in that situation. You don't know what their family life was like. They just had a very good family life. The parents were good stand-up people, hard-working, nice people. These are the kind of people that if you saw them out when you were working on your lawn and they pulled by in the truck and said hello, they'd invite you to dinner. You know, they were just good people. So you can see how that that would really drive you crazy in Fred's situation, having somebody write a book about it and say, say poor things, or maybe an entire blog. That's really got to tear your psyche a little bit. Look, the only way you're going to be a good chess player, the only way you're going to be a good investigator, the only way you're going to be good at much is look at every side of everything. Look at the other side of it. Fred can't be too bad of a father. You had a couple kids in West Point. You got a couple kids in West Point. I think Fred was an excellent father. I, I, he went through a divorce. The the family still stayed, you know, as a unit with with him. Like they were they were able to do things that they enjoyed doing together, like um, like hiking and and they all they you know the, like the the whole thing about Fred being strict with his kids that was just a parent teaching his kids. That was just a parent saying you can be better. That's you know it's it, I, they, 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 I'm not there's there should be no apology for saying you can be better and you 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 should try harder. What was it about Bruce when you went to his property and you told him you were there and you were looking around? Was there something? instinctive that you felt about Bruce that you didn't, or did you ever look into him and, and suspect him for foul play in this? Or what, what, when was the turning point when you said this, this is not where my investigation should be directed? Oh, he was in pain. He was just in pain. And him and Kelly both, Kelly was just neurotic and he was in pain and they were doing anything and absolutely everything they could possibly help. They would have done. He would have cut off his hand and handed it to me if I would have given his daughter right then and there. <laughs> you know, and then if I thought I should have looked at him, I would have. The police did. Initially, the police really jumped all over him. Right, because that's like statistically, that's what you should do, right? It's always somebody that you know. Yeah, but when you look at her situation, when I sat down, it was you know they laid everything out. So, I mean, yeah, they could have laid out this huge red herring for me, but it just wasn't that way. I don't know how to explain it, but it just no, wasn't no, you, that way. I mean, you, you, look at, you look at somebody like Fred who's put in countless, countless miles and hours and effort and money. I mean, God, this guy's gone above and beyond to just do something. Uh, was it in the book that they said something about when they would go uh, on their hikes and stuff up in the mountains up? Uh, they would stop at camping areas and that Fred and Mora would sleep in the same tent. And then they thought that that was weird. It sounds familiar. Get the fuck out of yeah. here. If you're a parent, if you're a man and you have a daughter and she's 10 years old and you're going camping, you can't, you sleep in the same tent. The last thing you're going to do is put her in a tent 10 yards away. Right. Where right. She's there, alone. Are, there are goddamn bears up there. You know what I mean? You're just not going to do that. It's just that's that's ridiculous to make to make something of that. Of course, they're going to stay in the same time. Sure, and then you then you put out there. You know, they you don't even have to say anything beyond they slept in the same tent together. You just let the sick people connect the dots. Right, right. Yeah, everybody everybody gets off on that. Oh, there's something to do with that. No, there's not. Just right. let it go. Right. If there was other things to back it up, I mean, that's different. There's never anything to back anything like that up. Yeah, I totally agree. And part of me wishes that you know we could we could have started doing this about five years ago instead of two years ago because the you know the the more the the people comment online and the the Reddit people and all of a sudden this comes out not even with the family but even with like the poor people who might look like Mora, the pictures that come forward and they're put online and it's like, this is Mora. And and you, you, the thousands of people contact someone's Facebook page and say, what's your name? Who are you? And then they shut down their Facebook page and people say, well, they shut down their Facebook page. They, You know, there's something to this. It's like, no, you just like accosted somebody who's got no idea what you're talking about. And they shut down their Facebook page. I, I, I wish we would have come into this 
like five or six years ago where none of this could have happened and who knows where we would be today. Yeah, that stuff's all very scary. You know, you look at her height, weight, hair color, this, that, and the other thing, and all this other stuff, well, that, that fits half the population. Yeah. I'm not, this, this is a true story. Tim and I were having uh, lunch at a restaurant and we looked across the bar at somebody who was sitting there and we said, if I took a picture of that person right now and put it online and said, I saw more at a bar, that person would, would be like, the, the, there would be, there would be thousands of people looking into who that person was. And it was just a brunette with dimples sitting at a bar and you took the picture and it was and and she actually looked right at the moment that the picture was snapped so i don't think she she knew that a picture was being taken but you could have bought it (laughs) you know if i was just a randomly searching images and and someone said that was maura murray and i said oh at a bar oh wow you know what that yeah maybe she's in her 30s now that i I could that could be her but obviously it wasn't we were there i mean we were just talking about it and we're just like oh hey let's take a picture of her right we literally were having that conversation like it could be we we it could very well be that person right over there and then we looked at that person and we said wow that could that that is exactly what happens is that somebody sees yeah, when you when you're stopping for gas at some small gas station in the middle of New Hampshire, and you see somebody who's got brown hair and dimples, all of a sudden that person happens to be Mora, and you keep going back there and you keep checking it out, and that person starts saying like, "This guy keeps coming into my place," you know, and then oh wow, she doesn't work there anymore. Uh, she must be running. No, dude, she's running from you because like you're a creep. Keep <laughs> like, her. Because you're stalking her. Think about your height, your weight, your size, and whatever. And then the thousands behind thousands of people that you're looking through, you're going to find people that look the same. It's gonna, it's a distraction. Um, so they have to fit everything else. They have to fit a criteria. You know, if you went up into Canada and you found a girl who was living there and couldn't produce any identification and things are kind of sketchy, and her boyfriend's American, too, and all this other stuff, then you start going, wow, okay. Not only does she look like her, but all these other things fit, too. So, yeah, it can be a huge distraction. Anything that that helps, there's always going to be something that feels like it takes you back four steps before you go ahead, like one step. We had talked before about Bruce asking me, you know, you're not withholding anything from me, are you? Kind of thing. The only thing that I ever purposely withheld from him was people would send me, you know, that, that was back when they had the website and the tip line and all that stuff. And for a while, my number was out there and stuff. I hadn't done that in a long time, but um, I would get people sending me pornography and saying, this is her. I'm not going to show him that. It's just ridiculous. It, 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 I don't even people were just looking at porn and seeing a girl look like her and sending me pictures and saying this is her. We got that too. You look at it and you're like, no, this is this is clearly not. This is clearly not that. It's clearly not. And if you follow the information back, you find out it's from Norway. You know, as far as like you, you asking where to where to start with more and all that stuff, you know, that's that's looking back. I guess having all the information that we have now, that's a, that's a hard thing to talk about. I mean, it, there's there's so much. It's like Brianna. There's so much information out there now. And it's, it's overwhelming, you don't, you'd have to pick through the good and the bad and really go back, break down to the basics.